Thank you. Uh, the organizers asked me to discuss viral-like particle uh, vaccines. Uh, I agreed this is a, uh, the bioengineering of virus-like particles to be used as vaccines is probably one of the biggest advances in vaccinology in the last decade. Uh, so I'll try and touch on uh, some highlights. The overview I'll be giving you today is um, touching briefly on the production of a virus-like particle. Uh, I'm using an HPV Gardasil example, but they're very similar for other systems. Um, how to characterize these virus-like particles, and especially how the analytical approaches that you're using, how you can establish that you have an understanding of both the manufacturing process and the product. Uh, answering the important question of how virion-like the virus-like particle really is. And then when you make a change in the manufacturing process or a facility, um, or moving to a different facility, does that change matter? And finally, we'll touch on comparability. And that's a, a word that's used to demonstrate that the material made at one site or at one process is the same as the material made at another. So um, this concept supports process and facility changes and helps you demonstrate control and consistency. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is an example uh, manufacturing process for a uh, virus-like particle. This happens to be Gardasil, a uh, human papillomavirus, VLP. Uh, it's made in yeast. It doesn't matter if your virus-like particle is made in a mammalian cell system or another cell system. You still have to harvest. And then once you harvest, um, you usually have a nuclease treatment, treatment to knock the DNA and RNA concentrations down very low. You clarify, and there's usually two column chromatography steps involved. One's called capture, one's called polish. Capture, you capture the material, wash it extensively, polish, you get rid of um, most minor impurities. And then you um, ultrafilter to remove very small molecule impurities, exchange into your uh, drug product buffer, and then um, if you have an adjuvant, you absorb it to aluminum, or in this case it's aluminum, other adjuvants. The uniqueness of this process is that after the final chromatography step, there's a disassembly, reassembly step of the particle. And that's critical. And what that did was it allowed them to control aggregation of the particles, um, and it allowed clearance of the proteases that were uh, rampant in this uh, process. Uh, as you'll, I'll show you, the virus-like particles are uh, just filled with buff buffer and whatever residuals are there, so by opening it up, it allowed you to purify it away. So as a grounding for you, um, there's a well-established model and pathways for assembly of virus-like particles. Uh, and in this case, we started from a major capsid protein called L1. And L1, it's relatively small. It assembles into pentamers, five L1s together. And then those assemble into a series of intermediates, either two or three pentamers. And they can assemble into large uh, particles, medium or small particles, or even as tubular structures or filaments. And this is totally determined by um, the conditions of the assembly process, such as pH, ionic strength, um, and even the ratio of certain conformations that I'll show you. So this process with the disassembly reassembly was important. So the majority of the material that came through the process prior to the reassembly or disassembly and then reassembly, we'll call it as an intermediate, it was a process. You can see it's not really well formed. You can see the individual capsomeres. And once you reassemble to the final aqueous product, you get the expected approximately 60 nanometer virus-like particle. This is done using atomic force microscopy. And think of it as a probe at the nanoscale that drags across the virus and shows you the surface of the virus. Okay. Clear. More powerfully, though, are emerging methods for imaging, including cryo-electron microscopy, and I'll summarize these in a table for you later. With using automated particle sizing and counting techniques, you can differentiate between not only the different forms I just showed you, from small, medium to large, but also different types form different uh, assemblies 
And in this example, I hope you can see with the lights, but these are the virus-like particles after reassembly. Um, and this is a population versus of nanometers versus population of two different serotypes that have been automatically selected uh, from these cryo-electron uh, image samples. The power of this is you can look at hundreds of thousands of particles and get statistically meaningful uh, statements about the homogeneity of your samples. But it offers you a lot more understanding about the characterization of your particle. This is um, to, meant to show you how you can do slices through reconstructions of all the different images that you see. You, you've taken these hundreds of thousands of images and pulled it together. And you can then assemble it into a three-dimensional structure. I've had the middle cut out to show you that it was empty. And that was one reason for disassembly, to get rid of trapped impurities so that when you reassemble it, it's clean. Um, but you can see that this is uh, approaching about nine angstrom level of resolution. These days, you can probably get down to two or three angstroms using single particle imaging approaches. So it was useful for both characterizing the structure of the uh, particle, but also helping us develop test methods, especially ELISA methods, for uh, being able to measure these and characterize them. And I'm going to need you to pay a little attention here. But this is a, um, one of the structures I just showed you. And please look at this middle dot, Okay, that middle cap smear. You can see it has one, two, three, four, five partners. Does everybody see that? Five partners. Now take your eye and move it to this one, and you'll see it has six partners. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So the packing of this, it's totally done by packing, either has five-fold symmetry or six-fold symmetry. So you have one protein, an L1 protein, that took two different conformation, two different shapes. Okay, and those are what are determining whether you're gonna get big ones, mediums, or little ones. So what I'm showing you here is that using the FAB uh, pieces of uh, monoclonal antibodies, um, you can localize the yellow is the FAB binding um, to each of the sites here. So this is um, without the antibody and that's with the antibody to show you exactly where that particular antibody in yellow is binding. But you can get a lot more detail than that. So, Different monoclonals uh, localized to different epitopes, and this is especially powerful. But if you have monoclonal antibodies that have been shown to compete with a normal human response uh, from polyclonal serum, and you can characterize these antibodies, now you can see exactly where they're binding on the product. And um, this particular antibody, it's the yellow one I just showed you. I have not changed the virus, it's just a different color scheme. You can see it binds regardless of whether it's a five or a six. It binds to everything, but it sits right on the top, right in the middle of the capsimir. And here's an antibody that binds only six-fold axis. And what I'm trying to show you is there's nothing bound to that fellow, and it's only ones on the side. So you can have a ratio of antibodies in your ELISA assay that gives you a very clear and dependable readout on the ratio of five to six fold uh, capsimers present as a surrogate for being able to measure the consistency of your disassembly, reassembly, and the conditions used. Uh, so this table uh, summarizes not only this technique, but a few other techniques. So um, in the course of the uh, last decade or so, non-intrusive biophysical and immunological methods have been reintroduced for both virus-like particles and viruses now. And um, they're somewhat different than the conventional techniques. So for transmission electron microscopy, instead of using negative stain, almost you always use cryo-EM because you have a vitrified sample. There's no adsorption washing involved that might alter the sample. Atomic force microscopy, it's the one I told you about dragging a probe across the surface. It used to be done using adsorption to a surface, now using flow through micro surfaces and flow through cells, you can do these in solution so no adsorption to the surface to again minimize any distortions or changing. In terms of the antibody binding or antigenicity analyses, um, radio labeled immunoassays or ELISAs are typically used. Uh, sample binding is analyzed as it's absorbed to a surface. Um, surface plasmon resonance techniques are more commonly used now. 
Uh, sample binding is analyzed in solution, so you're, again, not adsorbing. And then for antigenicity determination of vaccines, instead of sandwich elizas, solution competition elizas are being used because they allow, you don't have to have absorption to a surface and it allows the uh, confident assessment of what this particle looks like. Now, before you get into these selection of elizas, we've characterized some antibodies, we've built a, a method, we want to make sure it correlates with something meaningful. And this might be the most important slide in the talk. So to my knowledge, this has only been twi done twice for uh, virus-like particle vaccines to show this correlation. This is the correlation of the logarithm of a uh, ELISA normalized amount of protein versus the logarithm of the uh, immunogenicity of the uh, particles in a mouse model uh, plotting the ED50 assay. So for the mouse, potency is increasing going downward. I hope you see, guys see that. So as you go down, it gets more potent. As you go this way, it gets more potent. This, in blue, the circles, is the non-assembled VLP, the material before you disassemble it. And you can see it has a relatively low mouse potency and a relatively low ELISA value. And as you, after reassembly in this cluster, you see you have increased mouse and increased ELISA potency. And in solids are human clinical data to show that that also tracks with the level of assembly versus not assembly. So we call it a correlation. It's rough, but it works. And it works well enough for you to get away from having to do an in vivo test because you have an in vitro method that you can use to characterize uh, and measure the potency of your vaccine. Uh, without this correlation, you'd be stuck mostly doing um, in vivo assays because the immunology is just not that well understood. Okay. okay, shifting to the final part now is on analytical comparability. This is uh, some jargon, but it's used for uh, biologics and products that are well characterized or specified. And you may have seen it for the monoclonal biologics. It had been rarely done for vaccines because they were considered to be too complex and too difficult to uh, establish. They were um, mostly driven by their recipe rather than the pro qualities of the product. So well characterized means you understand the properties of the product that are important to make the product effective. Um, these strategies will facilitate the approval of a change in your manufacturing process. Uh, without a clinical trial, if you can establish it. It's hugely important to be able to do this, both in cost and time. And uh, it has to be done prospectively. Um, so you're saying, these are the tests I'm going to use, and here's the boundaries it needs to have for us to establish that it's comparable. Because you're usually doing this on a licensed product, and you don't want to go back and redo a clinical trial. One of the more difficult issues is you can't always uh, state if a change in some analytical method matters. So it's very careful that you validate your methods, and validate I mean is show that they're able to detect a difference that's, even if it's small, it's meaningful, and those are the only methods you take forward in your comparability study in terms of characterization. So by this I mean you're not gonna do infinite testing. It's, it's not how much your document weighs, it's what it says. What methods do you have in there that show me I could see a difference if it was there? And the testing strategy is validated with known samples, with known difference in performance. Can you can prove that I have the methods present that could see a difference if it mattered? Okay. Okay, so the ideal case in terms of your strategy is you have two samples. They differ in their characterization data. They differ in their process source, they differ in their potency, it might be in your mouse model, and they if, they, if you can show they differ in clinical performance, fantastic. That's hard to do, but you can, if you can get that. Having this in hand, you'll be able to validate that your assays are sensitive enough to see significant changes that matter in the clinic. Okay. Now, the way you uh, prospectively state how am I gonna make a decision is you set limits, and these limits are set ahead of time to establish potential, what the potential deviations and how they'll be interpreted. It provides rigor and credibility to your exercise. It's no fair to do comparability after the fact. That's not the way it's done. 
So there's two types of limits. One I'll call acceptance. And uh, excursion from that means you failed. It's on the widest boundary. It's usually three standard deviations, but it's pretty wide. If you see a deviation from there, process A, process B, sample A, sample B, failed to be comparable. Alert limits are a bit different, usually two standard deviations, two sigma. An excursion results in an investigation, but it's not deemed a failure a priori because it hasn't hit the fail limits. It's not a disaster. And they must be sufficiently rigorous, but not so tight so that you have what I call nuisance alarms. So you're constantly getting uh, flags that something's going on. So it had, if, if the more statistically meaningful and based on your experience it is, the better uh, the process will be. So your decisions for the, characterizing the product, for the acceptance and alert limits, you use your release tests and your, when you do validating of the process, the critical quality attributes, especially around impurities. Alert limits tend to be only your characterization tests. Okay? Now, the characterization tests tend to be qualitative, so you're comparing patterns, things overlaying, because a lot of times they're more complicated than getting a single number. So you're looking at a fingerprint or a pattern. Um, so profiles for intermediate product stability, uh, circular dichroism, FTIR, things like that are very um, qualitative. Okay. So this is real. This is a, uh, the results of the analytical comparability for the material before it was put on aluminum, pro, uh, aluminum adjuvant, called the drug substance, uh, for the licensure of Gardasil. And what you can see is that there's four types, HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18, and three manufacturing lots for each. And um, with the test methods that were involved and the weighting that was put on them in terms of how important they were based on the clinical and biological relevance, I think you'd understand that mouse potency is trumps whether you have a small deamidation site. Um, so what you see is that uh, all the parameters in the table were within the acceptance limits. So we had no excursions outside of acceptance. We had three excursions of alert limits. Um, so that meant we had some investigations to do. And uh, scanning calorimetry, which is one of those layover compare models, depended on whose eyes were looking at this and saying, yeah, they're, they're close. Okay. So try to avoid those kind of methods. That's a nuisance try to get them more quantitative, but um, they're very powerful, but they're just difficult. Uh, the free thiol was a showing a manufacturing glitch and buffer preparation uh, for that one, so allowed to do an investigation. So what I've tried to show you here is some examples of how you use relatively advanced characterization methods to understand your, your um, analytical toolbox for being able to uh, manufacture and lot release um, a product, like a virus-like particle. So in summary, the disassembly and reassembly of virus-like particles most often produces more virion-like monoclonal antibody reactivity. It acts more like the native virus infection in terms of the immune response. The structural and functional methods for analysis of recombinant VLP-based vaccines are uh, extremely important during the development of your manufacturing process and even post licensure for changing sites or changing the process. If you're lucky and, you're, and your product has a huge uptake and lots of sales and you have to move it to a lot of countries, that's where this becomes critical. You want to meet the global public health demand for it. Uh, in vitro antigenicity, so that's using a simple ELISA, for example in an epitope-specific manner, based on the EMs I showed you, very specific epitopes, is the best surrogate marker for in vivo immunogenicity or vaccine efficacy. So if you can establish this correlate, that it's hugely powerful for your manufacturing process and your ability to both understand what a change is and whether you can establish control. Uh, Analytical data can confirm the comparability of products. So these programs were taken forward without a single clinical trial to establish. That's rare for a vaccine. And it was because we had a good characterization package. So the comprehensive analytical characterization package is absolutely essential 
for any uh, change in a manufacturing process, a change of country, change of location, to show you can make it the same way uh, in the development life cycle for a vaccine, especially as we're starting to take these products into developing world sites. Okay? That's all I have.